Today we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting with verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So Saul had some of his attendants said to some of his attendants, Find me someone who plays well, and bring him to me. One attendant answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with, it, with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them with him to his son, his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much and David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. When the spirit from the Lord came upon Saul, David would play the harp and play, then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we are just thankful for this day that you've given us. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And we pray that you just please help us to understand your word today in a way that's pleasing in your sight. Please give me the words of wisdom to explain it accurately. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. In the passage we just looked here, we're actually seeing the first and second king of Israel. The first king was Saul. And Saul's a very interesting guy. He really studied his life. He starts off okay. And then he lets his pride and arrogance get a hold of him and he starts to sin. And he, he really goes downhill. To the point what we see here. Saul has already broken God's word twice. And God has already determined to take the kingdom away from him. So now an evil spirit is tormented him because the spirit of the Lord had left him. And this is where we start to see the breakdown of Saul's life. From this moment on, because he didn't realize it, but he is inviting his replacement into the kingdom. He's bringing in David, who is going to be actually the standard bearer for all kings. At the end of the day, Saul has no one by himself to blame. The kingdom was his, but it was his sin. It was his sin that, that caused him to lose his kingdom. What we're going to look at today is now Saul has a choice. Now that God has determined that Saul is going to lose his kingdom, now that God has determined that Saul's sin has ruined everything, Saul now has a choice and how he moves forward. And what we see with Saul is he starts this sin, he starts his fall, and instead of stopping at some point, because you would have thought this was rock bottom for him, God telling him he's going to tear away his kingdom, this evil spirit coming upon him, you would think that this was the, 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 the rock bottom for him that he would stop, but he doesn't. What we're going to see in today's lesson is how Saul continued to rebel, and how that rebellion cause him even more problems. Because at the end of the day, some people think that their answer to their problem is sin, but all sin does is bring more problems. Sin never fixes anything, it just creates more problems. Now in order to see this, we need to turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 28, start with verse 1. 1 Samuel, chapter 28, start with verse 1. In those days, the Philistines gathered forces to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. David said, Then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Achish replied, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now Saul was, as our Samuel was dead, and all Israel mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shinoam, where Saul gathered all the Israelites and set up camp at Gilboa. 
When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by the dreams of the rumor of prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium. So I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, put on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up to me the one I name. The woman said to him, Surely you know <coughs> what Saul has done. He has cut off from among the spiritists, the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring my, about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, Who shall I bring up to you? Bring me up, Samuel, he said. When a woman saw Samuel, she cried at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up from out of the ground. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Samuel, then Saul knew it was Samuel. And he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length to the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your maidservant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. And he refused and says, I will not eat. His men joined him and uh, joined the woman in urging him. And when he listened to them, he got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fat and calf in the house, which she had virtued at once. She took some of the flour and kneaded it and baked bread without yeast. Then she sat before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. In this passage here, a lot of things have happened. Let's go back and set the, the groundwork. On more than one occasion, Saul has tried to kill David. Despite the fact that God has, has chosen him. Saul had continued in rebellion and rebellion and rebellion. And once he started the path of sin, he never stopped. Till we come to this moment when he does this ultimate sin here. What was his problem? Saul had not come to terms with the fact that God had rejected him as king because Saul had rejected the rule of God. Now this is important to understand. When we say, well, why did God reject him? Well, why did God reject him? It's because Saul did it first. He pushed away God. He told God, I don't want to be in line with you. I don't want to listen to you. He kept disobeying God time after time again, and every time he disobeyed, he kept thinking he was going to get the blessing of God somehow. The more he rebelled, the further he got pushed away from God. The simple fact of the matter is, if Saul had did what God had asked him to do, the kingdom was not going to be torn away from him, but he did And now he was losing everything because he had rejected the, the rule of God. Instead of repenting, Saul doubled down on his sin. It's an amazing thing. Repentance really does turn away the wrath of God. And repentance, you know, you may not get everything that you want, but God still forgives you. 
Saul never once repented. He grieved over the fact that he was going to lose his life. He grieved over the fact that he was losing his kingdom. But he did not grieve over his sin. And in this case, he doubled down because he went and spoke to a, a medium or a spiritist. This was strictly forbidden. This is part of witchcraft. This is something our society does not understand today. They think that it's a game. Playing with, you know, Ouija boards and, and looking at horoscopes and all this stuff. They, we, we treat it as a game. But God has strictly forbid this because that is the devil's playground. And one of the areas we see this is Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting with verse 9. The things that we sometimes think as harmless little games, God tells us not to mess with. We enter the land the Lord your God has given you. Do not intimidate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination and sorcery, who interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who has a medium or spiritus, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. In the text, it says that Saul initially knew the right thing, and he started to eliminate the mediums and spirits from the land. But then when, when he was completely given over to sin, when he had rejected God, and when God's rule was rejected in Saul's life, he now turns over to these mediums and spirits. You may ask yourself, why is God forbidden? Because, guys, you're dealing with demons of the devil. You don't get to raise up the dead. In all of Scripture, this is so unique that even some theologians disagree whether this was really Samuel or not. I believe that in this case it was Samuel. But it was so different from any other case. Notice the woman's reaction. When Samuel appeared, she was frightened. Why was she frightened? You ever, you ever wonder that? If your job is to call up dead people, and a dead person arises, why would it bother you? Maybe because you've never called up a dead person before. She was either A, a con artist, which many of them are, or B, she had been talking with demons, and for the first time, she actually saw a spirit. <coughs> Guys, ghosts are not real. I tell you that you're dealing either with demons or some mental problem. One of the two. Spirits. When you're dead, you're dead. You don't get to come back. Demons, they have a lot of access to everything. I want you to understand, you know, with the computer sitting here, I can tell you almost everything about your life. You realize that? I tell you things you probably even forgot. Now, if I as a human being can do that, what do you think a demon has access to? They got something better than the internet. <coughs> God told him not to be doing this. When God rejected him, he legitimately turned to the devil and didn't realize it. His disobedience cost him his kingdom. Now it would cost him his life. We need to learn that sin is never the answer. Whenever we're dealing with problems, whenever we're dealing with all, or actually the problems from our own sins. Do you ever notice that? When somebody is dealing with the problems of their own sin, sometimes they turn to more sin. All that does is dig you a deeper hole. Sin is never the answer to any problem. All it does is create a whole new set of problems. If we want to escape the problems of sin, then we have to turn to God. If, if Saul would have done this, his life would have turned out different. 1 John chapter 1, start with verse 5. The Apostle John tells us the answer to our problems in this world. 
This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, and have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our hearts, in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Sense never the answer. And that's what the scripture is telling us here. Repentance is the answer, not continual sin. There's an interesting thing when you compare Saul and David. They were both told they could not do something. David was told that because he was a man of war, he could not build God's temple. And instead of being disobedient, he says, well, if I can't build it, and if I can't say David never lived to see this temple, I will prepare my son for this. When Saul was told his kingdom was going to be taken from him, Saul could have said, I don't get to keep my kingdom, but here is God's chosen, I can help prepare him for it. And in some ways, Saul actually did help prepare David for it, he just didn't know he was doing it. Had Saul did that, Everything changes. When Moses repented, he got to see the promised land. When David repented, he got to keep his kingdom. When Saul continued in sin, it cost him everything, including his son's life. Continual sin causes continual problems. Repentance brings the solution. What the problem is, is much like Saul, we don't like what the solution is. Because Saul was not going to give his way. And when we look at sin and repentance, what we see is, well, I don't get what I really want, so I'm just going to continue to, to go down the path of sin. But as Samuel foretold, Saul was going to die. Saul would be defeated just as he was told. This is found in 1 Samuel chapter 31, starting with verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 31, starting with verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell slain at Mount Gideon. Saul, uh, the Philistines pressed hard after Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abedadab, and Mephishah. The fighting grew fierce around Saul. When the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and run it through me, and, or these uncircumcised Philistines will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on him. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that day, same day. When the Israelites along the valley and across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines of the, um, to proclaim the news of the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Asherahs and fastened his body to the wall of Beth When the people of Gemesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valid men journeyed through the night to Beth They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons of the walls of Beth and went to Gemesh where they buried them. Then they took their bones and buried them under a tarmish tree in Gavish, and they fasted seven days. Despite how valid of a warrior Saul had been in the past, 
This now overtook him. God had made a promise to Israel. When they were faithful to him, he, they would be unstoppable. However, when they were disobedient to him, they could easily be defeated. This promise is seen back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting with verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting with verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed in the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant the enemies that rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come from at you from one direction, but they will flee in seven. We're, skip over now to verse 25. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will come out at, from them in one direction, but flee in seven, and you will become a thing of horror to all the kings on earth. Verse 25 is repeating what would happen if they were disobedient. At the end of the day, Samuel, or excuse me, at the end of the day, Saul and all the people of Israel knew this. Had Saul been obedient, the Philistines could not stand up against him. But because of his sin, he and the people of Israel would now face a horrible defeat at the hands of the Philistines. Saul was defeated by the Philistines because of his sin. He did evil and continued down an evil road. As a result, he had to face the consequence of his sins and lost his life. But it wasn't just his son, his life, his son's lives that day, and also the lives of the people of Israel who fell in battle that day. A lot of people paid for the price of Saul's sin. And some of you may say, well, is that fair that Israel fell in battle here? Why not just Saul? Why couldn't Saul be the only one that died? Because Israel originally asked for a king to lead them into battle, and God gave them exactly what they wanted. If you turn to the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel, God tells Israel not to ask for a king, and for about two, three hundred years they didn't. The book of Judges lasts anywhere, depending on who you ask and who the methodology, it's somewhere between two to four hundred years. It's the book of Judges. So for two to four hundred years, Israel is without a king. They go and ask for a king, and God's like, you don't want to do that. Yeah, we do. We want to be like everyone else. That is literally what they said. We want to be like everyone else. God says, he's going to raise, he's going to cause you to have taxes, and he's going to force your children into service. They said, that's not going to happen, God. Isn't it really funny when men tell God what's not going to happen? So Israel, against God's wishes, Against God's decree, against God's warning, asked for a king. And when they saw Saul, they rejoiced because Saul was taller than anyone else. And they said, this guy will lead us into battle. And he did. And they lost their battle because of their king. The very one that they asked for is the very one that caused them to get defeated here. He was wicked, and the nation suffered. Which now will set up a pattern in Israel's history. For about the next 400 years or so, Israel and Judah are going to have kings. And these kings are sometimes going to be righteous and sometimes going to be wicked. And the people fell because of a wicked king. Because of the sin that they established, because of the sin that the people went along with, because the king said to worship this god, and they would, or worship this idol, and they would, all these sacrifices, and they would, and do all these sins, and they would, they just listened to the king and their sin, and they went down the wrong road. This starts a pattern for Israel and Judah that would eventually lead them into punishment. Just think, if their ancestors had just listened and not asked for a king, 
how their life could have been different. And just think, if they would have thought for themselves, instead of listening to a king and going down the road of sin that the king told them to go down, how different their life could have been. Now, righteousness and wickedness followed the king. And the people, like sheep, would simply follow the king. I want us to understand that there are consequences to our sins as well. Today, that's what we're talking about. That there are these consequences. Saul had these consequences, Israel had these consequences, and we had these consequences as well. We live in a society today that thinks that we can do whatever we want and it doesn't bother anybody else. We think we live in a society today that think that we can sin and get away with it. And there are some consequences. I was on social media the other day. Gosh, some of you guys will remember this. I, uh, I guess the announcement that uh, Magic Johnson had AIDS was, uh, you know, this week in history. How many of us remember hearing that and being shocked that Magic Johnson, at the height of his career, that, that you know, he was still playing great basketball, but yet because he went out and had sexual relations, which is against God's word, against God's will, he developed AIDS. And how the nation was shocked that that happened. You know, one of the things that's very interesting is when you talk to people and you, you counsel them as a minister and, and they tell you about their sin, they're like, I just can't believe that this happened. Well, you chose a route. You chose behavior. You knew was wrong. And there's consequences played for it. Sin has consequences. God gives us grace. As I said, this is not the road that Saul really had to travel. He chose to travel when he saw his sin and he was told about his sin. He simply kept going down that same road. And all he had to do is at some point listen to the warnings of Samuel, listen to the warnings of God and God's word, and stop and repent. He just refused to do it. At some point, all of us will be faced with our sins. We will be faced with our sins when we realize that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, when we fall in rock bottom like, like Saul, when we, when we as a nation will pay for the consequence of acceptable sin. The question is, what will we do when we face our sins? Will we, like Saul, keep digging the hole even bigger until there's nowhere else to fall because death is at our door now? Or will we repent for the forgiveness of our sins? Will we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Will we turn our life around? Well, I was taking communion and passing communion today. You know, always the one thing that, that the communion does to me anymore is I see how much more grace is made available by God. Every time I see the bread that's not picked up, the cup that's not been used, it's just simply a reminder that that was one more soul that could have been at the Lord's table. There's an old hymn that, that says, there's room at the cross. Guys, there's always room for God's grace. He just doesn't force it upon us. We've been talking for weeks and weeks on end about a vaccine and whether it should be forced or unforced. And we talk about whether that vaccine is really useful or is it not useful. I can tell you this. Gospel vaccine works 100% of the time 
against sin. And it is the only cure for sin. But it has to be chosen. Will you choose that cure for sin today? Or will you take your chances that life will give you one more day? That choice is up to you today as we stand and sing our professional song.